all right. Uh, let's see. We finished up all the 1.9 parts, so this is 9.1.9 questions today, but it's not due today. And then, if you have any questions, last final, last final questions for 17 and 18, we can do those two. So we're gonna go 17, 18, 19, and then we'll turn in 17, 18 today. Uh, let's see today's review, and then we have a little test coming up on Friday. Yeah, just a small, itsy bitsy tiny tiny test. Yeah, okay. yeah let's go. Um, so for the exam, don't forget you guys can have one sheet of paper for yourself on the front cover, front of it. Put down whatever you think you need for this exam. So flip back through one point six. One full sheet of paper. Good. And tra oh, transformations might be a good thing, right? Uh, all the different functions that we've covered might be a good thing. Because I'll just say graph this function, graph x cubed. So graph the cube root of x as a parent function. So you should be able to do that. Will okay. we be able to use our calculator on the test at graph or no? This no. Uh, no. This is uh, this is the last non-calculator test I think we have. Afterwards, we'll have a calculator section. However, I am stupid, so I think I deserve a... Now that I taught you how to use a calculator, you can use it, but we'll use it later. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, before we begin, let's do this right quickly here. No? Oh, cool. Okay, uh, let's see. Just I don't forget because I want to do it in a particular order here. Let's go with, um, yeah, we'll go this way here. So first things first. Is uh, the simplest math problem in the whole entire world. Oh, I know. I know. I know. I know, I know, I know. But no one can solve. <laughs> Joe, video. What? What video have you not watched? I don't think there is one. Okay, so let's see. Let's go with it here. Uh, so easy problem. Let's go. This is the most dangerous problem in mathematics. One that a lot of mathematicians are warned not to waste their time on. It's a simple conjecture that not even the world's best mathematicians have been able to solve. Paul Erdős, a famous mathematician, said mathematics is not yet ripe enough for such questions. Pick a number. One sec, guys. One sec. Seven. Good choice. I'm gonna come on. Like Let me do this here real quick. Here. I need to unhook. Oh, just when I hook it up. I know, but I have twenty I only have like seven. But they're the one time. Sorry, class. One second here. There it is. Okay, got it. Okay, we're going to apply two. That's loud. I think that's still rules if the number. Okay, now we can bring it down. And let's go with it. Let me restart real quick here. Four minutes worth. This is the most dangerous problem in mathematics. One that young mathematicians are warned not to waste their time on. It's a simple conjecture that not even the world's best mathematicians have been able to solve. Paul Erdős, a famous mathematician, said, mathematics is not yet ripe enough for such questions. Here's how it works. Pick a number, any number. Seven, good choice. Okay, we're gonna apply two rules. If the number is odd, we multiply by three and add one. So three times seven is 21, plus one is 22. If the number is even, we divide by two. So 22 divided by two is 11. Now we keep applying these two rules. 11 is odd, so we multiply by three, 33, and add one, 34. Even, divide by two, 17. Odd, multiply by three, 51, add one, 52. Down. Even, divide by two, 26. Still even, divide by two, 13. Odd, 
So we multiply by 3, 39, add 1, and that's 40, which is even. So we divide by 2, 20, divide by 2, 10, divide by 2, 5, odd. Multiply by 3, 15, add 1, 16, divide by 2, that's 8, and then 4, 2, and 1. Now, 1 is odd, so we multiply by 3 and add 1, which equals 4. But 4 goes to 2, goes to 1, so we're in a loop, and the lowest number is 1. Now, the conjecture is this. Every positive integer, if you apply these rules, will eventually end up in the 4, 2, 1 loop. This is commonly called the Collatz conjecture after German mathematician Lothar Collatz, who may have come up with it in the 1930s. But the problem has many origin stories and many names. It's also known as the Ulam conjecture, Kakutani's problem, Waits conjecture, Hass's algorithm, the Syracuse problem, and simply 3n plus 1. Why is 3x plus 1 so famous? Among professional mathematicians, maybe it's not famous but infamous in the sense that if someone actually admits in public that they're working on it, then there's something wrong with it. <laughs> the numbers you get by applying 3x plus 1 are called hailstone numbers because they go up and down like hailstones in a thundercloud, but eventually they all fall down to 1, or at least we think they do. You can think of the numbers as representing the height above the ground in meters, so a number like 26 would start 26 meters above the ground. And if you apply 3x plus 1, it rises up as high as 40 meters. And in total, it takes 10 steps to get to 1. So 10 is called its total stopping time. But take the very next number, 27, and it bounces around all over the place. In fact, it climbs all the way up to 9,232. As an altitude, that is higher than Mount Everest before it too falls back to the ground. In total, it takes 111 steps for 27 to get down to one and end up in the 4 to one loop. The paths that different numbers take vary so widely, even numbers right next to each other. So how do you even start to make progress on this problem? Well, honestly, mathematicians struggled. People just decided that this was something invented by the Soviets to slow down US science, and it was doing a good job at it. And everybody's sitting there twiddling their thumbs and making no progress on this trivial thing that you can tell school children. Jeffrey Legarius okay. is the world authority on 3x plus 1. We can stop the there first time. Right yeah. No, 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 no. no? A little more? Made by the Soviets. Made by the Soviets. There it is. About Legarius? Good job, Adam. Here. Everybody sitting and twiddling their thumbs and making no progress on this trivial thing that you can tell school children. Jeffrey Legarius is the world authority Could you imagine on three x plus one. Being the world the authority first time on a problem. I, him, I was a, a senior in college, and he pulled me aside and he said, "Don't do this. Don't work on this problem." Like, no, don't do this. That's so interesting. Writing. Do real math for a while to establish Alex Kontorovich didn't listen. He and Yakov Sinai looked at the paths of the hailstone numbers. Were there any patterns? Well, obviously, all of them end up at one, but what about the paths they take to get there? The pattern is randomness. Here is the sequence of a large number chosen. I'm going to stop random. there. So if you get interested or you're bored, like, yo, you, you, the Kulak's conjecture, that's what you want to go into. And then drop so low that you can't really see what's happening at this scale. But if you take the logarithm, you find this ugly graph with a downward trend. It looks kind of like the stock market on a bad day. And this is no coincidence. Both are examples of geometric Brownian motion. That means if you take the log and remove the linear trend, the fluctuations are random. It's like flipping a coin each step. If the coin is heads, the line goes up. Tails, it goes down. 3x plus 1 is just like the random wiggles of the stock market. Over long enough periods, the stock market tends to trend upwards, while 3x plus 1 trends down. Another way to analyze 3x plus you there? Uh -huh. Brownian motion, yeah, uh, by Browning, uh, mathematician.
Not brownie like the one we eat. No, not that one. All right, so wanted to show you this one real quick here. So that is an, an unsolved problem in mathematics. There is actually a website devoted to six unsolved problems. So if you want to earn a million dollars, they're worth each a million bucks. Okay, good, good. Got your interest here. This is, uh, the, it's called the millennial problems. Um, and one person did, and they're worth a million dollars each. And here they are. This is the things that are stopping mathematics from progressing on. If you get it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's unsolved. It's unsolved. So then how do you know if you get it right? Like, uh, this is, this well, is it's such it's a modern day thing. It's like, how do we progress science into the future? I know. We'll just put this stuff on the end to it. And, and some random and person. Million dollars. You know that someone like Joe is going to come across <laughs> it and be like, I'm going to devote my day to solving it. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm going to be the world and an expert in a problem that I can't solve. It's going to be like something like someone helps me on a keyboard and it's gonna solve it or something. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny. Yeah, let, let's go. Let's go to one of them here. Uh, set it up here. So this one. Uh, this one's probably an easy one to sort of get our gra grasp our mind under underneath here. This guy is uh, Pythagorean theorem, isn't it? Right there, yeah. x squared plus y squared equals z squared, or r squared, or a squared, yeah. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Yeah. So it, it's a problem in mathematics. The question is this, um, which integer values or which fraction values are solutions to this? And is there a pattern to those values themselves? So oh, no. is there a generalized equation that can generate all those values? So can I, so another way to say it is, can I create a function that, somehow gives me those values right away. That's easy enough just to sort of like, hey, I, I want to see. So, so you want evidently it's not numbers. numbers. Uh -uh. Say again. So you want to see two fractions. Two fractions, or well, three, three, set of three fractions that if you plugged in and they will actually make the statement true. And is there a function that gives me all of those fractions? Can I? Can I press a button? It'll say there. Here's all the answers. So is there? Uh huh. So when you just could you just solve all of the possible answers and then have it set? Oh, good, good. Noah has a good idea here. If you solve all the possible, the only thing is you have one equation, but you have three different variables, so you can't intuitively solve. You don't have an algebra one. You have one variable with one equation. You could solve for that, right? But now you have three variables, and that's what makes it so ambiguous. If you had two variables. You can make a relationship between the two. Once you get three variables in the equation, you can't establish a defined relationship anymore. Wait, wait, so wait, that's wait, where. Wait. It goes. What is it asking for? Is it asking for a squared plus a squared plus c? A squared plus c. Uh huh. Uh, so give me all the different number solutions that are possible, and is there a way? Is there a formula that gives me all those possible? rational solutions so all fractions all possible fractions that can satisfy that equation so like what is it exactly asking for i'm confused what it's asking for um we'll have to get into the numbers on it. i want to get the numbers now because we don't have that much time here but um give me all fractions that can be put into x y and z that would be solutions for, what? for that equation for x squared plus y squared equals z squared all fractions. Uh huh. So, so if like you, three, three and 18. yeah. So uh, like three, four, and five, right? Though that would work into, but those are, but those are integer values, right? We've played with integer values for a long time. We know uh, Pythagorean theorem integers a lot, right? We know the three, four, five triangle, correct? Yeah. That's an easy one. <laughs> So let's just delve into it. Just one third is um, is two thirds, right? What? Square root of one third is one ninth, or the square root of the square of one third is one ninth. Yeah. So the square root of one third should be two thirds, right? No, sorry. No. The square root of one ninth should be one third, right? Yeah. Yeah, so in, in, in the progress of mathematics, we have played with uh, Pythagorean triplets for a while. I mean, this has been a, so we have something called generators for these guys. So if it's integer values, um, everybody agreed here, three and four and five, will that work? 
Uh, how about 5, 12, and 13? Does that work? 5, 12, and 13. I don't know. 5 squared plus... 25 plus 144 does that give you 169 um no <laughs> yes yes it does not yes, it is. yes it does. absolutely so these guys 5 12 13 are called generators of all of them and then what we do is we multiply by two these guys will also work though any multiplier of our generators work so we've in mathematics for the last so many years we have played with integer values for pythagorean theorems so for the pythagorean the square root of if you have a squared plus the square root of b squared equals the square root of c squared i don't know that's why it's called the math problem if you, if you ever start solve playing one of these, can you split them on those i'll think about it i'll think about it or if you win you don't give us any more homework for the rest of the year <laughs> oh <laughs> what yeah. year so, so the problem is asking what happens if you put fractions inside here so essentially it's asking this right here what fractions a over b c over d and e over f is there generalized formulas that can give me all those numbers and and give me values so i'm going to stop there so we can, we can actually go on with the math class here but interesting does it pique your interest does the uh a million dollars the a million dollars, okay <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There was a person that solved one of the problems. Um, I've got one 19, 19, yeah, uh, 1980s or 90s, I forgot. And then he gave it away to charity. All right. With that said, I thought that was a fun one. That was a cool one to, to start. Okay, now let's begin here. So let's go with uh, homework for 1.7, homework for 1.8, and then any questions off 1.9. So let's do 1.7 first, just in case if there are any other questions here. Make sure you look it over, see if there's any. Uh, Noah, yours was from 1.8 or 1.7? Nine. Nine, okay, perfect, yeah. We two questions on 1.7 already here, so just make sure that there's no others as you guys are thumbing through some homework. Can we go through um, 1.8, 9C? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so nothing from 1.7. Let's jump to 1.8, uh, 9C. Perfect. Any others Any others from 1.8 uh, yeah. as we jump to this? 45A, uh-huh. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to have to Okay, those two. And if you guys have any more for me, let's go for it here. So 1.8, number 9C. Here's the first one we'll do real quick here. And 9C says, find for me f g of x. So it's the multiplication of the f and the g function. The f function for number nine is x squared plus six. The g function is the square root of one minus x. Oh, wow, that's fun. A square root function and then a square function. And I got to multiply these together, okay? So I'm going to have that right there. Let's see. This just means I take the F function and I multiply it by the G function. And I don't even know what the back of the book would actually say to this here. So I have that right there. Is that right? Let's go. Let's go. Oh, yeah. yeah, 9C. Elika, what does the back of the book say about it? I think it just says that. Yeah, I think they just left it. Okay. Uh-huh. You could square all of it. Uh, if you do square it at that point, then you are changing the number around, right? The only thing that I could think of doing something, if it, if it was to do something, because this guy's tied in as one big piece, right? It's a square root, right? You can't undo it unless you square stuff. So, I mean, the only thing that you can do is you can distribute. So it'd be like this, plus that right here. So that's probably the only thing you can do. So one of those two answers is totally correct in that. Normally when we see a binomial, binomials are like this right here, right? That's x plus six, so we can do x squared minus three, and then we, we can multiply that out, right? Because it's two binomials multiplied together. Okay, I'll go, we go down. 45A, this is 1.8 still. 
Okay, 45A. Use the graphs of F and G to evaluate the function. Ooh, that's fun. Depends, right? Okay, this is two here. I got to redo the, recreate the functions here. Uh, it goes through, uh, so I'm going to put individual dots here. So it's at zero, four, it's at one, two, two, zero, three, two, and four, four looks like four, four. This is the F function. The G function, and of course it goes like this. The G function, that's kind of fun. It's just a straight line coming down at four, three, two, one, zero. It's just that function there. Okay, so question for 45A is what is that right there? Well, let's see. So this is the conceptual understanding of this stuff here. So what is G of two? So since it's the G function, we go this way. And we have so one, two, three, and four. So this is four, that's three, there's two, there's one. I need this guy. Ooh, okay. Show it to me just a bit here. Okay, so let's go with two here. Um, the output, the output of G of two is, anybody? Is just two, right? Input is the x-axis. Output would be the y-axis. So that just becomes a two, except now we got to plug that two into the f function now. So it's called the reiteration of functions here. So we go from one to the next one. Yep, as so we plug in the, now we go here. Two goes here, therefore it becomes a zero. Are we good there? Should we go? So you go the other way. Let's do B just real quick here. Just make sure we got this here because this is just a conceptual understanding is important to have here. Uh, this one's going the other way now. So question is this, if I plug in a two in for F, what happens? Zero, perfect. Yeah, right here is my two. I plugged in, I get a zero. If I plug a zero in for the G function, what's my answer? Uh-uh. Uh -uh. Four. Four, that's right, because zero is right here. And there's my answer now. So answer, four, are we good? So just because you go one way, if you go G of, of F of G of two, doesn't mean you're gonna get the same answer going G of F of two. Okay, 45 good? Oh yeah, perfect. Okay, so Landon is asking what happens if we actually wrote the equations for these functions here? Doing sophisticated mathematics here. Okay, so um, you guys talk to me. Does what does this look like? What kind of function? Absolute value function. It looks like this. Now, what did we do to the absolute value function? We went to the right two units. So how do you show going to the right two units in an absolute value function? Inside. Uh huh. X minus two. There's our function right there. Okay, so I have a solution for the problem to see what uh, see what something always will be. Cool. Hey, hold up, just that, just so we can finish up. But please tell me afterwards here. Okay, G function. This is a line. Is that a line right there? This should be in the form of y equals mx plus b. So you guys talk to me. G of x is what's my slope? My slope? Negative one. Okay, I got scared. Uh, what's my y-intercept? Plus four, yeah, so there it is. There's my two functions right here. Now let's see if I plug it in so you get the same thing. I won't do, let's just do, ah, we'll get it both. So if I plug in a two into here, two goes in here, negative two plus four, two. two. Then I go over here and I plug in a two into there. Two, two minus two is zero, so absolute value of zero is zero and we get checked out on this one. Let's go the other way. 
plugging in a uh, two directly into here first. Get zero, and then I take that zero and I plug the zero into this guy here. Negative zero plus four. four. Yeah, we get a four. Cool, and so it works both ways. No problem. Good question though. A good, nice higher end question there. Okay, 1.8. Any other homework questions on 1.8? Going once, going twice. So, Thank you. Oh, 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 oh. I thought someone's going to jinx someone else and not make them talk for the rest of the day. Okay, 1.9. Let's jam to 1.9. Any homework questions off of that? Noah? Yeah. Five, yeah. Five. Okay. Any others off of 1.9, guys? So inverse functions. How was the section itself? Good, bad, ugly. Okay, just that one question. <laughs> Some people would not know. Okay, besides 45, going once, going twice. Sold, okay. Uh, 45, ding, ding, ding. it says find the inverse of F, graph both that one and that one, describe the relationship. Now the graphing part, no, is it you have trouble or just finding the inverse itself? So I did all of this and I checked the back to work and it said that the F minus X was four X minus, square root of four minus X squared, which is the exception of the problem. So that's what's happening. Ah, oh, gotcha. Okay, so let's go for it here. Analogy. And we'll talk about why that is. Okay, so real quick here, how do we do this? We write the function self, then we forget the fact that it's a function, we just make it in terms of variables only. And then here's our switch right here. Our switch is X over here, Y over here. Now we're gonna solve for Y. We are gonna square both sides to get rid of the square root. So those are gone. I get x squared is equal to four minus y squared. I am going to subtract four from both sides. So x squared minus four is equal to negative y squared. Ah, that's no fun with a negative there. So I'm going to uh, divide through by negative one here, divide by through a negative one here. And if that's the case, then that becomes a negative. That becomes a positive, and I can actually write it as four minus x squared, giving you y squared. Almost done. Then you do the square, square root. root. Uh huh. Yeah. So let me put the y on the left hand side. I do the square root, and I give myself that piece right there. All right. And when I do take the square root, notice I don't put plus or minus over here. And the reason for it is because I'm, my X values are set between zero and two. And if they're between zero and two, I'm never gonna have X values there. Oh, let's check, let's check what we do here. Okay, so there's that. So notice what, that's just not nice because I my inverse function is the exact same thing as my function itself. That's no fun. So let's see why that's so. Let's go here, I think. Yeah, no really problem. Let's go here. Let's go to this guy. And so, do you guys remember with the? Um, I think I put conditions on here. Okay. So square root of uh, four minus X, is that right? To the second power? Uh, four minus X, yeah. Okay, there's that. And it is between zero and two. So if I plug in a zero into here, that's four. If I plug in a two, let's see if I can, I think I can state conditions here. Let's see, uh, zero less than X, less than two. I think I can 
do it that way. Ah, I have to build a sliding scale here. Hold on. Now yeah. I'm going to forego here. Let's just kind of write on it. So um, right here, between here and here, here's between zero and two. Everybody agreed? Because here you're going to get negative values and we're not dealing with negative values. So the condition on our homework, zero is here, two is here. And then do you remember in order for um, inverse functions, right? They just switch X's and Y's, is that right? So notice if I were to switch zero to, where would that be? Two zero. Two zero here. And if I switch two zero, it gets me back to zero two. If I switch that one, which is a square root of two, square root of two, it's just gonna flip on itself, right? So this little portion right here of the graph is really gonna flip to this side. And this portion is just gonna flip to that side. That's all we can kind of have. So that's why it's the same thing because you flip it over on itself, it's just gonna give us that. Um, okay. Just a bit of curiosity here. Oh, oh I'll have to play with that a little more. Okay, Noah, does that make sense? Yes. So graph wise, going back here, if we were to graph it, you. I have that graph. And then to graph the inverse function, I have the exact same graph right on top of itself. State the domain and range. And that's the other one here that we do. So let's go with the f of x, square root of four minus x. And the domain is already given, right? It's this is my domain. The inverse function. And we have, since it's going to flip right on top of itself, that's going to be the same thing here. So domain gets you zero x over two. Okay, there's my domain. So then whenever you do a, a function that's inverse, what happens is that's what happens. Your domain, remember, because we switch x's and y's, right? So that means the range becomes this right here. Now it's just the y values. And then since we have this condition set upon it, that means this is my domain here, which also means that that's my range over here. Okay, see if that makes sense, because remember, it just flipped right on top of itself. Right? So domain and range did not change whatsoever. All right, talk to me. Any other questions off of? Off of the homework, going once, going twice. Okay. Let's see, I'm gonna stop the video now. Let's see, we have a review for the test itself, is that right? So I'm gonna pause the video here and we have a game to play. And we have Jeopardy for 